you have your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. And I begin reading verse 33 and read through verse 37. Matthew, chapter 27, if you have your Bibles, please. Don't, don't ever get in the habit of not bringing your Bibles to church. I think we get lazy sometimes and say, well, pastor has scripture up on the PowerPoint. That's not enough. You need your own Bible. And I have more scripture up today than I usually do. Because I realize we have people that don't bring the Bibles and are using this thing, but you need to bring your own Bible. Matthew 27. Let's stand together, please, as we read verse 33 through verse 37. Matthew 27, verse 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. You ever thought about that? Just scourging, beating, humiliating, and then watching him. How depraved the human mind is. Yes. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The precious Son of God. How would you have felt if that would have been your child on the cross? And people were mocking him. And then as he was hung naked, beaten, scourged, blood flowing down his body, people were just watching your child. Your child. You see, God Almighty offered Jesus on that cross. Verse 37, and they set up over his head his accusation written. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Fathers, we talked of this morning uh, how you open the grave. And Lord, you open the grave because you open the greatest truth this world has ever known. That the gospel is the good news that brings, that reconciles men to God. And we thank you how you not only open the grave, but you open our minds. You open our hearts to truth. And Lord, once again, we ask you to open our minds, our hearts, to the greatest truth anyone could ever know. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Last week, I went in detail on the cross of Jesus. But I want to tell you that the death of Jesus was a tragic injustice if you look at it only on the standpoint of human justice. You see, the trial was illegal. The charges that were brought upon Jesus were false. Do you realize that the witnesses that they brought before to accuse Jesus were paid to lie? But you see, Scripture tells us that Jesus died willingly. Now look at verse 11, if you will, in chapter, this same chapter, just look back. And the Bible says, as Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. In other words, you, you said it. You're right. Right on, brother. Yes. Verse 12. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Here's thought thou how many things they witness against thee. And he answered him to never a word, and so much that the governor marveled greatly. You see, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53 and verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. In verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Why? Because in Isaiah 53, verse 11, the latter part of the verse, the Bible says, For he shall bear the, their iniquities. Jesus was our sin bearer. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 puts it like this. For he had made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God Amen. in him. 
But I want to ask you a question this morning because so often we go through the routine of Easter. As I've already mentioned, Easter is a wonderful time. But I think some people think that Easter is just about a bunny and lilies and people getting new clothes and, you know, singing some happy songs at church. And somehow they don't stop and think of the beauty. And the beauty is this is the greatest truth that this world has ever known. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Now, I'm going to give you several thoughts this morning. And my prayer is that you might remember these as long as you live. And who knows? We, none of us may live another day. But let me give you three truths that you ought to remember. Why Jesus died on that old rugged cross. First of all, Jesus died that we might live through Him. You see, salvation cannot be earned. Salvation cannot be purchased. Salvation may be free, but it's not cheap. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 John 4, verse 9, And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only uh, begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. If I were to ask you, if you died today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? Any other answer other than, yes, I know because I place my faith in Jesus Christ. He purchased my salvation. Amen. And I trusted Him. Any other answer, you'll never go into heaven, into glory. Yep. You see, He died that we might live through Him. Now let me give you a picture because the Bible gives many pictures. And the Bible pictures the condition of the lost. Now, if you identify yourself in any of these pictures, take a look at yourself and realize that you may be deceiving yourself. You may think, well, I know that I'm going to go to heaven someday. But if you're ever asked about it, you may say, well, you know, my dad was a good man. My mama was a good woman. And they told me that when I was born, they saw a little halo on top of my head. They thought, surely if anybody goes to heaven, it's this little boy right here. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Everyone must come to repentance and personally receive Christ or reject Him as their Savior. Now, let me give you the first picture. The first picture is a picture of a lost sheep. You remember when Jesus spoke in one of his parables? He said, "What? Well, which one of you, if you had a hundred sheep and one of those sheep was lost, that you wouldn't leave the 99 and go look for that sheep? Now, I tell you that there are billions upon this earth, but yet the Lord Jesus came into this world. And if you were the only person on this earth, I believe the Lord still would come for you because he loves you that much. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You know, I studied sheep years ago. And I remember studying about sheep. And I learned so many interesting things about sheep. But the thing I kept thinking was, God identifies his people as sheep. He said, you're the sheep of my pasture. And the first thing I learned about sheep is, sheep are dumb. Did you know that? They're not the smartest animal that God created. Another thing, sheep go astray easily. Why do you think they need a shepherd constantly uh, provoking them to stay with the flock? And sheep are easily deceived. But yet God says that we are like sheep, lost sheep. And then secondly, God likens us to blind men. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 says... In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Have you ever heard that expression? And the Lord gave it. He said, you know, you're like the blind leading the blind. He was talking a bit about people that didn't know anything about God, but yet they were telling people about God. And it's amazing to me how people are blind followers now. Yeah. They just believe anything. So, well, why do you believe that? Well, you know, it was on the internet. I mean, you know, somebody Instagrammed it to me. I mean, you know, it's true. Let me tell you, there's only one thing that you can rely on in this world, and it's God's Word. 
And God's Word tells us that we're blinded. And most people are blinded to the truth of God Almighty. And that's why God established His church. We are to be a proclaimer of truth. We are to be a lighthouse warning people of imminent danger. And then thirdly, God likens uh, people to wayward children. Look, already today I've talked to a parent whose heart was broken over a teenage son. And this morning, if I talk to all the parents here, you can tell me stories of how hard your heart was broken of a wayward child. Now, the Lord told us that this would happen in our lifetimes. And many of you can remember when you spoke to your children and you said, look, here's the line. Don't cross that line. If you cross that line, there's danger. And you know, most time children are kind of like we are. If you see a sign that says wet paint, what do you do? You just want to put your finger and make sure it's wet, don't you? Well, that's how kids are <laughs> sometimes. You know, I'm a pastor, but I also feel like I'm a daddy. And I love our youth. I love them so much. And sometimes I see our youth that are going in a direction that they ought not go. And I understand, I'm not their parent. If I was their parent, I'd lock them in their room for the next 10 years. <laughs> Take away their cell phone. Slip them a piece of bread every once in a while. And say, 10 years later, you won't get out of your room. Y'all don't believe that, do you? <laughs> Kids are looking at me like, whoa, I'm glad he's not my dad. But my daughter's here in this service, so y'all are going to ask her, did he do you like that? Way with children. You say, what do you mean by that? You remember the parable, the parable of the prodigal son? The Bible says in Luke 15 and verse 18, he said, I will arise and go to my father. Now, why did he say that? I'll tell you why he said that, because he ran out of resources. It's amazing we can, look, when we're fat and happy and got money in the bank and everything's going our way, hey, 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 party time, my friend. But let everything fall apart. Yeah. Let your health start to decay. Let a crisis come. All of a sudden, things aren't so good. And this guy, it wasn't just that he ran out of money, he was in a pig pen. I mean, he smelled bad. I mean, he was starving to death. And so he said, I will arise and go to my father. And I'll say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. By the way, that's what you need to do first when you come to God. It's not that you've sinned just against anyone else or even against yourself. You've sinned against a righteous, holy, almighty, sovereign God. He said, I've sinned against heaven. And before thee, you know what he said? Here's how you know there was true humility and repentance. He said, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. He said, make me a hired servant. He said, just give me a job. Maybe washing people's feet or slopping the hogs or just feeding the chickens. I'm not worthy to be your son. I brought shame to the family. And that's how God likens us. And then God also likens us to a dead person. Man, I don't know if you've ever seen a dead person. Remember one time I was at Parkland Hospital in the morgue, and I'll tell you later why I was there, but it didn't take too much time right now. But all of a sudden I was standing there, and they brought a dead body in front of me, and it was covered up. And somebody asked a question, now, what's the number here? I think they put numbers or something on. I said, I don't know, I can't remember. Let me see. And so he lifted up the cloth. Oh, my soul. I'll never forget what I saw. I'm not going to describe it to you because some of y'all need to eat lunch afterwards. I saw a body that I could hardly recognize. And what they did was they had a number or something on the person's toe. I'll never forget what it looked like. I'll never forget the smell. And even when I walked in, I asked the guy, I said, hey, what's, what's that smell? I said, do y'all have a broken sewage or something outside? And he looked at me kind of funny. He said, uh, do you know where you're at? I said, well, it's a morgue, right? He said, have you ever smelled dead bodies? I said, no. He said, what you're smelling are dead bodies. And we got a bunch of dead bodies right behind me. He said, you want to go see them? I said, I don't think so. I'll pass. You see, folks, there's nothing pretty about a dead person. 
But did you know God likens us to dead people? Before you come to Christ, you may think you have life. You don't have life. You have temporary life. Yeah. It, the Bible calls it a vapor. Right. Your life is but a vapor. It appears for a little while and vanishes away. You don't have eternal life until you come to Christ. Yeah. When you come to Christ, that's when God gives you life. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and what? The life. The life. Man. When you come to Christ, He gives you life. Until then, you don't have it. And the only thing you're destined to is eternal separation from God. That's why Ephesians 2 and verse 1 says, And you have he quickened. Now the word quickened means to make alive or to resurrect. You have he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sin. Now let me give you some thoughts about dead people. Did you know that dead men do not respond to physical things such as touch, words, care, love? That's why you can talk to a person that doesn't know God, doesn't care about God, doesn't love God. And you can say, you know, at church, we're going to have a wonderful service and we're going to have special singing. And you know, it's Easter Sunday and I'd love for you to come. Oh, now get out of here. You see, they really don't have the emotions that God wants of them. The reason is because there's something dead inside of them. Did you know dead men have no appetites? Next time you go to a funeral, get your favorite food or that person's favorite food and just wave it in front. No, don't do that. But you know, just if you put some food in front of a dead person, you know what? They're not going to respond. Now, if they're alive, they'll probably jump out of that casket and eat in front of you. But dead people don't have appetites. You see, there's nothing really that's appealing to someone other than for them to please their own flesh. And their own flesh is just, I want to do what I want to do. This is all I want to do. Don't bother me. And what's the real problem? They're dead. They're dead to the things of God. Dead, another thing, dead men don't have the ability to serve or to work or to respond. You see, that's why some people, I try to get some people to work for God and serve God, use their talents for God. No, man, no, 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 no. You can't get dead people to do anything. And that's what's wrong with a lot of churches. They got people that are filled with dead people. People that aren't quickened by God. They don't care about God. That's why they don't respond. Another thing, dead men need to be quickened or be made alive. In other words, they have this need. As I mentioned this morning in my morning message, the greatest need that we have is the need for us to know how badly we need God. Why? Because we're sinners. We're dead people. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, you need not turn there, but in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible says this, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. And did you get that? We're dead. See, there's that picture. But he quickened us. What does the word quicken mean? It means to be made alive. God gives us life. That's the, the power of the resurrection. And he says, by grace you are saved. And then hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, he raised you from the dead and all of a sudden you enjoy spiritual things. You want to come to church. You want to be with God's people. You want to praise God. This morning we've heard praises to Almighty God. And for those that are saved, your hearts were so full. It looked like they were probably going to burst. But God gives pictures of the condition of the human heart. That's why the Bible says Jesus came. Why? That we might live through Him. And then secondly... Jesus died that we might live for Him. Not just through Him, but for Him. Can I ask you a question? Why are you living your life? What is the purpose of your life? Well, it's kind of like uh, years ago, uh, Dr. George Truitt was on a train. He was talking to a young man. And he said, hey, what are you doing, son? Well, I'm a student. What are you studying? Well, I'm studying this. He said, well, what are you going to do when you graduate? Well, I intend a good job. And then he said, and what then? He said, well, I'm going to get married. Well, what then? He said, well, I'm going to have children. He said, well, what then? 
He said, well, I want to enjoy life. He said, well, what then? He said, well, I'm going to retire. He said, well, what then? He said, well, then I'm really going to enjoy life. And then he said, well, what then? And he said, well, I guess I'm going to die. And then Dr. Truett said, what then? He said, I hadn't thought about that. You know, the problem is we don't think about the life to come and there is a life to come yes, and I tell you the only reason we're on this earth is to prepare for eternity okay, Amen. that's the only reason and some of you are prepared and some of you are not prepared Prepared. but the Lord wants us to live for him you say where's that in the Bible St. Corinthians 5 verse 15 says and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. May I tell you that the biggest problem with mankind is selfishness. Amen. Selfishness is at the root of all sin. You see, selfishness breaks up friendships. It breaks up marriages. It causes fights. It causes wars. Why? You have one person wanting their way. Another person wanting their one way. It creates friction. But you know, for Christians, we ought to live, may the will of the Lord be done. Yeah. And God said we ought to pray every day, thy will be done. You say, Pastor, why are you pastor in this church? I believe it's God's will. You say, Pastor, what are you going to do tomorrow? I'm going to do what I believe is God's will. I think it's God's will for me to go camping. <laughs> Can I get an amen from everybody? <laughs> but you know, the only cure for selfishness is for us to realize how much God loves us. And we ought to also ask God to give us that same measure of love. Can I tell you that the Bible teaches us that the only way we can be have make a difference is the Bible says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. Now, how can you have compassion? A young man who was starting out in the ministry and was struggling and he did everything. He was taught in seminary and preached every sermon that he had prepared. And he would just get nowhere. So he wrote William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. And he explained to him how he was kind of stuck in the mud and couldn't get anywhere. And he just asked him if maybe he could give some advice. As to how he could see some sort of success in the ministry. And William Booth wrote him back and he was surprised when there were only two words that were written on that letter. And here's what those two, word, two words were. He said, try tears. A lady had prayed and prayed and prayed for her son. She went to her pastor and said, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I pray for my son for years to come to Christ. He said, Pastor, if you tell me what I need to do, I'll do it. And the pastor, he wasn't trying to be hard or cold. But he said, you need to be broken over your son. You need to love your son so much that it breaks your heart to the point. He just shed tears over the day and night. Amen. Remember Jeremiah was like that? He's known as a weeping prophet. And you know what? She prayed until God broke her heart. And then she went to the pastor and said, I, My heart is so broken. I love my son so much. He said, Now what else do I do? He said, Just write him a letter. She wrote him a letter. And, I mean, just like that, her son responded to him and told how he received Christ. And afterwards, the lady said, the, the mother said, son, I've been praying for you for years. What was it? What was it, son, that touched your heart? And the son showed his mother the letter and said, mom, you may not realize it, but this letter was soaked in tears. And mom, I didn't realize how much you loved me until I saw all the tears that flowed from your eyes as you wrote that letter and expressed your love to me. May I tell you, when God looks down from heaven, I believe tears are streaming down his eyes because people are defiant and rebellious. They're selfish. 
And they don't experience the love that God has for them. And they don't love other people. Let me give you a passage. 1 John 3 verse 14 says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because what? We love the brethren. You know, you look at people in our church, we've got all kinds of people in our church. We got smart people, we got dumb people. We got funny people, we got sad people. We got uh, crazy people, and I could go on and on. Don't raise your hand when I call out what you are. Okay? <laughs> Everybody knows it. So. <laughs> but isn't it wonderful how we all love each other? Yeah. Yes. I remember when Nicholas came in our church and I started naming people and I said, So have you met so and so? He said, Yeah, yeah. And he just, he said, you know, I know they're a little strange, but I love them. <laughs> I will not tell you who he's talking about. <clears throat> the Lord said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. You see, Jesus died so that we might live through him. In other words, it's almost like Jesus carry, is carrying us to heaven. No Jesus, no heaven. But if you know Jesus, you can know that you're going to heaven. And then that we might live for him. But let me show you the most important truth that I want to give you this morning. Jesus died so that we might live with him. Did you know that we were created in the image of God? Do you realize that God has a kingdom for his people? And God wants to rule and reign with his people. Do you realize that? Do you realize God longs for eternity to you, for you to be with him more than you desire to be with him? That, that, it's almost unbelievable. Sometimes we think, boy, a baby died. How could that be? How could their life be caught so short? Or somebody died in their prime. Now, I don't understand it all. And I'm not trying to explain God, folks. But I think sometimes God looks down and he says, you're so precious, so God. Just come on up here with me. And God takes them home. And then sometimes, like me, he leaves me here a long time. He says, get straightened out, Raymond, and then I'll bring you home. Amen. I'll probably be here for another hundred years. But uh, the Lord wants us to live with him. First right. Thessalonians 5, verse 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together. Say those last two words. There it is. He wants you to live with him. John 17, 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Did you know God wants you to look at his glory and splendor? Think of the most beautiful thing you've ever seen on this earth. That's nothing compared to heaven. And God wants to say, look at there. Look at there, my child. Looky there, looky there, looky there, looky there. Oh, Jesus, who's that for? I made that for you. That's yours. Behold his glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. I think God showed David something like this, because Psalm chapter 27, verse 4 says, One thing about desire of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life to the whole beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You remember David at the end of Psalm 23, he said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now I tell you, Jesus died on an old rugged cross that you might live through him. Without Jesus, we can't go to heaven. But then while we're on this earth, he wants us to live for him. Are you living for him? Well, Pastor, I'm just here because I heard you're going to have a lot of candy. Let me close by sharing with you a couple of truths. The philosopher Socrates, while he was lying on his deathbed, was asked. Because, you know, people ask him questions his whole life. You know, philosophers are supposed to have the answers. We got, we got a lot of the modern day philosophers, you know. You say, where, where do you find them? CNN, MSNBC, the internet, social media. <laughs> oh my goodness. What's sad is nobody listens to the Bible anymore. Everybody just looks at their phone and says, oh, look at here. This is great, you know. But look, folks, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. 
So come to church, plug in, plug into truth. When Socrates was asked, will you live again? You know what his answer was? His answer was this. I mean, here's a famous philosopher, and he was asked, when you die, when you live, by the way, isn't that the greatest question that you ought to ask during your lifetime? And there's no telling how many questions he was posed during his lifetime, but evidently he never thought about that. But when they asked him that question, here was his answer. I hope so. I wonder how many people answer that way. Can I tell you that Job, the oldest book in the Bible, Job had the tenacity to ask God. He said, if a man die, this is in Job 14, verse 14. He said, if a man die, shall he live again? And can I tell you how God answered Job? And Job didn't say, I hope so. Let me tell you what Job said. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body. You see, this body is just dust. I know we spend a lot of money on this dust. That's all it is, folks. It's going to return to dust. He said, after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh. You see, that's the resurrected body. He said, in my flesh shall I see God. He said, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to see him. Not somebody else. I'm going to see him. Though my reins be consumed with him. You see, folks, you have a divine appointment. Yes. And wouldn't it be wonderful if on this Easter Sunday, you would settle that matter of whether you're going to heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. It all depends on what you believe about Jesus. You see, the gospel is this. Jesus died on an old rugged cross. Why? So that we might live through him. Why? So that we might live for him. Why? So that we might live with him. Amen? Amen. And then he was buried. And they said, there, he's done. That imposter. And three days, as Brother Roloff used to say, he got up and said, good morning, boys. The world has never gotten over the resurrection of Jesus Christ. People have tried to destroy and discredit the resurrection. But you know what happens if they make an intense study? They come to the knowledge of Christ and they believe on Christ and they get saved and their lives have changed. So listen, don't resist God. Just come to God. Let's stand together. Heads are bowed.